now look to Catherine Mayer to close the case for the proposition. Madam President, officers, members and guests, thank you for allowing me to speak here this evening at the Oxford Union. I'm honored to be in these august halls in which so many notable speakers have stood before. And because this is on the internet and therefore for the record, I must say we pronounce my last name Mar. <laughs> <laughs> I have to also say I never thought that I'd have to come to Oxford to debate the merits of empire. I thought by now we would have truly learned those lessons. <laughs> Yet I'm not here tonight to argue about technology. From arrowheads to movable type to CRISPR, there is no question that humans are technological animals continuously augmenting our world. And in doing so, we've brought our societies and selves great benefit from reliable food supplies to mass education to the potential for alleviating genetic heartbreak. In this sense, technology has been a tool of empowerment and agency, and we are healthier, wealthier, and better for it. But the motion before us today is not about the inherent goodness of technology, nor the inherent badness. Rather, it asks us whether technology as empire, and specifically organized, multinational, publicly traded technology companies, threaten the integrity and health of our society. And by the very de definition of a threat, we have already heard the opposition acknowledge that it is. Repeatedly, they have referred to the challenge before us. By definition, a challenge is a threat, and so therefore, I do believe we have conceded the debate. <laughs> you may be asking why I'm up here to argue this motion, as I myself come from what many would call a technology organization, the Wikimedia Foundation. The students in the room may know us as Wikipedia. You may remember us from your A-levels. <laughs> As the fifth most popular website on the planet, with hundreds of millions of users, we are indeed a technology organization. We are also an idealistic, distributed, and community-governed charity, which I believe it's actually the first part that qualifies me to argue on behalf of this motion. Naturally, in preparing for this talk, I consulted Wikipedia to understand how we define empire. I looked at not just the article, but the citation, which I strongly encourage you to do. <laughs> it was surprisingly difficult to find a definition of empire that is not normatively neutral. Perhaps this should not be surprising. To paraphrase Miriam Makeba, the South African anti-apartheid activist and former citizen of empire, the conqueror writes history. You do not expect the people who are invaded or who invade to tell the truth of the invaded. So what then is empire? If we accept that any definition of empire could be normatively neutral, we must look at the impact, what remains, rather than the qualities which it has. But what are those qualities? An aspiration to universality? A structure of consolidated or supreme power? And the means to propagate and defend its culture, power, and organizing principles? By any definition, I would argue that these technology companies fall solidly within. If you've been to Silicon Valley, you may be familiar with the term scale. Scaling is everything. This is an aspiration to universality, a desire to be everywhere, seemingly ubiquitous from your grocery store to your national biometric identity. From company names as verbs to the mantra of the mission, open and connected or consumer-centric, each has a foundational organizing principle, a coherent sense of identity. They are vertically integrated organizations that have more data than most ministries, and the very largest have more monthly actives than most nations have citizens. This is the structure of consolidated power. They build products that seek not only to acquire a single user, but your entire social graph, creating vast networks of acquisition and retention. The means to expand and defend territory. The vast top, excuse me, the top tech companies have revenue and cash reserves that distributed through complex supranational accounting structures retain market dominance through the acquisition or replication of their competitors. In the United States and Brussels, they rank among the largest lobbyists by sheer cash outlay. They are incontestably empires. And they have arguably improved lives, delivering a factorial increase in access of information enabling communication across time and space, investing in new markets, enabling R&D with budgets that dwarf even the most ambitious public efforts. But they are also purveyors of products that have tremendous influence on our societies, perceptions, thought, dialogue, and sense of identity and truth. So the question again is not whether we like their technology. I like their technology. I wrote the speech mostly on a Google Doc on my iPhone. But whether the costs of these advances come at too high a cost for our common social good. 
Most of these companies make their money through maximizing their revenue per user. One of the more common metrics that they use is time on site, how many minutes you park their eyeballs, your eyeballs on their product. The absurd but inevitable conclusion is that the winner is the company that owns your entire <laughs> attention span. And in effect, that is precisely how these products are optimized, regardless of whether your endless participation is ultimately in anyone's best interest. At the individual level, studies have shown that the rise of smartphones corresponds with an increase in alienation. At a societal level, these dopamine-driven fe dopamine feedback loops optimize for easy engagement over critical conversation. They cluster us with unthreatening and accessible ideas and individuals and isolate us from those who look or think differently. The product decisions are driven by a result of business models and a demand for endless growth and rising market valuations, demands that can only be satisfied by universality. Their product imperatives are to maximize now and account for outcomes later. The push to get more eyes does not necessarily mean that these companies are inherently bad. But unlike, say, a government service, they do not have to answer to you. They are accountable to the market, not to their users. In the case of our information feeds and search results, the in, nope. In the interactions we seek and share are trade secrets. The algorithms are unclear to most users. We do not know why we see the results that we see. We do not know how they may differ from those around us. We do not know if our guided interactions are the result of the best possible outcome, the maximization of revenue, the values of an engineer encoded into the system. We cannot see outside the fishbowl, which means we cannot, and often the companies themselves cannot, understand the full reach and impact of their work. One large temp company reportedly recently shut down some of its AI work because the AI had started speaking in a language incomprehensible to its very engineers. Governance experts note that a measure of democratic societies is whether they have laws that are comprehensible, that is, whether the citizens themselves understand the rules by which we consent to be governed. Arguably, neither you nor I can access, let alone fully understand, the logic through which our information and interactions are currently mediated. But if we can peek outside the fishbowl, the legal systems we operate on as a society are not built to address these technology giants. There is no coherent approach that exists to regulate the scope and scale of their work. And if we refer back to the nature of empire, that is precisely the point. Their power becomes yet another means by which to consolidate power and propagate the structures that enable them to defend that power against all challenges. They are not accountable to any one country or body of laws, which makes them difficult to regulate. They exist as supranationals practicing jurisdictional arbitrage that moves their servers, cash reserves, and your data from one favorable nation to another. That means that few large companies have access to incredible amounts of personal data about millions with limited oversight as to how that is stored and used. Now, there are rare instances in which these practices are good, such as when it present, prevents a company from complying with government censorship or handing over sensitive data to authoritarian regimes. And I will admit, it fully favors me as an American citizen with standing in the country in which most are domiciled. But statistically speaking, I am a fractional minority, and you in this room are very likely a disenfranchised subject of empire. That is the very nature of imperial rule, and that is the problem. So I must ask, how does it feel to be marginalized? Do you perhaps feel stripped of your agency as though you aren't being seen as an individual? You are not alone. I should take pains to note here that this is not by evil intent. It is the nature of design for scale because at the scale of billions, your individual use case is not efficient. It is an accident of universal aspiration. But that aspiration, when unfettered by accountability, maximizes for the majority and further disenfranchises the already marginalized. Products and the global problems they seek to solve are more often than not based on those in the rooms making the decisions. And we know that the majority of those in the room default to predominantly people of the Western world, predominantly male and mostly white. From the most innocuous example, the camera phone that <laughs> inverts all left-handed photographs, to voice recognition software that struggles with the accents of non-native English speakers, to women being more highly correlated with lower income jobs and their marital status, to algorithms that don't recognize darker skin, to the allocation of bioengineering research to the wealthier, whiter research subjects, to the fundamental questions of the ethics of automated warfare, we are all subject to the biases and assumptions encoded into our system. 
This means that we live in worlds in which harassment is not a design priority, in which political dissent may be automatically flagged as hostile, in which racism can be encoded at scale. It is a world in which your market value determines whether you receive fundamental services, whether your native language is encoded and supported, and whether you will receive fair hearing by terms of service review. This affects how you experience the world, how the world sees your experience, and whether your identity exists at all. So now, at the bell, I'd like to close. Returning to our original question, no one is here to argue if technology is bad. As Kranzberg Law notes, it is not good nor bad, nor is it neutral. And I am not here to argue technology companies are evil. They simply are in all of their contradictions. They are full of wonderful people with tremendous aspirations to do good in the world. They are marvels of engineering, wonder, and innovation. But they are also empires with incentivized to standardize, protect their competitive advantage, scale, and maximize shareholder values. The incentives of your our well-being, our societal integrity, our democratic systems and institutions are only somewhere midway on that list. And so that is why I am here to argue that this comes at too high a cost for our societies. Even if the values that I have described fail to move you, consider the cost. Our societies thrive when they are stable, when our citizens are engaged, when they have purpose and when they have means, when discourse is open and when it is reasoned, and when power is held to account. History teaches us that when these conditions are not met, we all lose. Are we willing to accept personal ease over the integrity of institutions, over the erasure of marginalized and minority groups, over the fundamentals of good governance, algorithms over agency? I, for one, am not. And I believe there are alternatives. I, in fact, have great faith that when we recognize a problem for what it is, we arrive at the opportunity to address it. Therefore, I urge you to support the motion of the House, recognizing empire for its harms in order to build the future in which we together thrive. Thank you, people, friends, humans here tonight.